Welcome to the second ever daily Math 105 review session. So we're going to try to cover all the stuff we need from Calc 1 and Calc 2 in just an hour. There are many different emphasis you can take in multivalent calculus. When I was at Princeton, we did a lot of stuff of cylinders hitting cylinders and finding the volume of the region in between. I hated those problems. The students hated those problems. But the students liked their friends to suffer the next year, so those problems kept being assigned. I made the pledge that I would never do this to my students. So we will not be calculating volumes of cylinders hitting cylinders. If you want to do that privately, let me know. I'm going to concentrate on the mathematics from Calc 1 and Calc 2 that's useful for solving a variety of problems. A lot of these will be economics and physics. So I'm not going to go over all the material. I'm going to try to emphasize the key points. I'm also going to talk about some of the proofs. I am a strong believer that if you understand why something is true, you have a better chance of using it correctly. Fortunately, all of Calc 1 reduces to one equation. One equation. Everything else is then consequences. It's the definition of the derivative. So definition of the derivative. You have some function f, then the derivative f prime of x is the limit, as h tends to 0, of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So there's a bunch of questions you should ask when you see something like this. The first is, for which functions does this limit exist? The next is, do I always have to go back to this limit definition, or are there shortcut ways to calculate the derivative? If I have combinations of functions, is there a nice way to get derivatives from combinations? So we'll talk a little bit about all that. The other thing is, um, I have two little kids. I like to tell stories to them all the time. You should like to hear stories as well. Whenever you see a function, make up a story. It should represent something. So f might be your temperature at some point x. In calc 1, you live on a line. All right, well, this is now multivariable calculus. x could be a vector. We could have some point on the Earth's surface. And f could represent the temperature. Uh, the most common example in calc 1 is you are in a car driving from point A to point B for some reason. And so f will represent the location or the distance of the car at time x. And you want to know as time passes, what's your instantaneous speed? So cars do not have a system that is able to calculate the speed at a given instant. They have a way, though, to approximate it. What they can do is they can look and see how many revolutions the wheels make in a small amount of time. The circumference of the wheel is not changing. So if you know how many revolutions the wheel has done, you know how far the car has traveled. You know the amount of elapsed time, so you can calculate the average speed. If you calculate the average speed in a small window, that is a really good approximation to the instantaneous speed. So again, if you're driving from Boston to Philadelphia, the average speed for the trip will not be a really good indication of how fast you're traveling in Connecticut. You, know, you may be hitting traffic that moment in Connecticut. You may be hitting traffic when you get to New York City. The smaller the region, the better it will be. Uh, one of the things we'll see later today is this local approximation. Looking at a function in a small neighborhood, we can replace a complicated function with a straight line. So typically, you, know, you have a picture that looks something like this. Here's time x. Here's time x plus h. And if I draw the line connecting them, the slope of this line is this quantity here. And what we're really using is that x plus h minus x happens to be the same as h. So this is traveled distance or elapsed distance over elapsed time. This is the average speed from x to x plus h. As h gets smaller and smaller and smaller, this becomes a better and better approximation. And in the limit, you get the tangent line. Okay, and then that's what we mean by the derivative. Okay, so now that we have the definition of the derivative, the question is, can we compute it? And so the first thing is, you know, you take some simple functions. Let's take f of x is x squared. I often like to just compute all the pieces I need first. And so what I'm going to show you right now is one of the most common mistakes people make when they do derivatives, is if I want f of x plus h, this is not the same as f of x plus h. The rule is f of input is input squared. And so here, it shouldn't be f of x plus h, but rather my rule is take the input and square it. This is x plus h squared, or x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And now I substitute into my definition of the derivative, and I get f prime of x is the limit, as h tends to 0, of x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus x squared 
over h. Alright, the first thing we notice is we can cancel the x squareds. And so we have the limit as h tends to 0 of 2xh plus h squared over h. I can cancel an h because each term here has an h. This is the limit as h goes to 0 of 2x plus h. This is the same as the limit as h goes to 0 of 2x plus the limit as h goes to 0 of h. And what you'll find is all the different rules you have for limits of sums, products of sums, these translate into uh, help in calculus. So we have two limits to calculate. So this one is basically clear from reading it. The limit as h goes to 0 of h is 0. Yeah, that's just what you get when you say it out loud. The first one actually has a history of causing problems for calculus students. As h goes to 0, what does 2x go to? 2x. As h goes to 5, what does 2x go to? As h goes to smiley face, it doesn't matter what h is going to. No matter what h you give me, I'm always giving you back 2x. And so for this problem, the derivative would just be 2x. Alright, so more generally you'll see the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, x to the fourth is 4x cubed, and in general the derivative of x to the n is n x to the n minus 1. So now what we want to do is we want to start building up uh, rules to calculate derivatives. So if your life depended on using the definition of the derivative to calculate uh, f of x is 112x to the n minus 1 plus 668. Now I give you some horrible mess like this. To put in x plus h squared and do this all out, you could do this. I'd be facing a lynch mob with you know, pitchforks and I think you know, fire if I gave a problem like this and asked you to do this from the definition. We don't want to have to compute the long way. We want shortcut rules. And so fortunately, there's lots of things we can do to save time. So the first is the constant rule. And that's if a of x is c f of x, then a prime of x is c f prime of x. Think of this as we're trying to reduce complicated functions in terms of simpler ones. So for those chemists in the audience, we're trying to reduce things to basic constituent parts and understand how they combine together. So what I'm saying here is, if I take a function and I multiply all of its values by 5, so at every moment in time I'm 5 times further than I was before, my speed should be 5 times as great. And again, always tell a story for something like this. The sum rule is if a of x is f of x plus g of x, then a prime of x is f prime of x plus g prime of x. If you want, think non-relativistic physics, you know, normal physics, you have a train traveling and you have somebody running on a train. And you want to ask what is their speed relative to somebody on the ground. You have the speed from the train and the speed from the person running on the train. They're going to add together. Uh, what would be the next rule? We have constant, sum, next thing. Power nope. Power nope, this is a simpler one. Simpler one. The difference rule. Uh, so some of my students have created the sum difference rule. Where we put it all as one big step. And say, you know, come on, what kind of difference does the minus sign make? And so in this case, the derivative of a difference is the difference of the derivatives. The reason I want to isolate this out is it illustrates a really good feature. I don't have to give a new proof for the difference rule. The difference rule follows from... Oh, maybe the police are going to make me give a new proof. Okay, <laughs> didn't think it was illegal. Uh, the constant rule and the sum rule give you the difference rule. Why? The derivative of negative g of x is just negative g prime of x. So what I can do is I can apply the sum rule with f of x plus negative g of x. Alright, this is not a huge deal here to save yourself proving the difference rule. But we'll see later that we can avoid having to prove the quotient rule. Okay, so I do apologize for the lack of blackboard space. Let's do the product rule. So, let's motivate the product rule. Let's let f of x be x cubed, g of x be x to the fourth, and a of x will be x to the seventh. So f prime of x is 3x squared, 
g prime of x is 4x cubed, a prime of x is 7x to the sixth. If life were good, if mathematics was kind, what would the derivative of a product be? What would you want it to be? You get, to, you get to choose what you would want the, the derivative of a product to be. What's the simplest thing you can think of? The product of the derivatives, right? Wouldn't that be a nice, easy rule to remember? The derivative of a quotient would be the quotient of the derivatives. Well, let's check and see. If I take the product, I would get f prime of x times g prime of x is 12x to the fifth versus a prime of x, which is 7x to the sixth. So I feel twice. I have the wrong coefficient and I have the wrong power. So clearly the derivative of a product is not going to be the product of a derivative. Always try special cases to build your intuition, to get a sense of what things should be like. And in fact, just looking at this, we can glean what the product rule probably is. I have to get up to an x to the sixth. Looking at all this stuff, I see two ways to do that. f times g prime and f prime times g. And so if I look at it like that, it's telling me, well, those two combinations will give me something of size x to the sixth. And I would get 4x to the sixth plus 3x to the sixth is 7x to the sixth. This is not even close to a proof, but it gives you some inkling that it may be correct. And so again, I'm a big fan of trying to build up intuition, especially as you start to see more and more complicated formulas. So this leads us to the product rule. And I'll actually prove the product rule in a few minutes. So we have the product rule is if a of x is f of x g of x, <coughs> a prime of x is f prime of x g of x, oh, oh I've dropped my line, plus um, f of x g prime of x. Okay, the next one I want to do is the inverse rule. Or well, sometimes it's called maybe the reciprocal rule. Might be better. I don't care about you memorizing the names of these things. If a of x is 1 over f of x, then a prime of x is negative f prime of x over f of x squared. This is actually a specific instance of the power rule, which somebody had mentioned a few minutes ago. If a of x is f of x to the n, a prime of x is n, f of x to the n minus 1, f prime of x. And this is just the special case when n equals negative 1. All right, and the last uh, that we'll do in the first part is the quotient rule. Uh, this is the most hated of the rules. a of x is f of x over g of x. Then a prime of x is f prime of x g of x minus f of x g prime of x all over g of x squared. So if you don't agree that this is the worst of the rules simulator, right, this has every feature that could cause trouble. You have to remember which function goes in the denominator, f or g. You have to remember which one gets the minus sign. Is it the f prime term or the g prime term? If you have something like this and you're not sure which way it goes, take a special example. So for your example, take f of x equals x, g of x equals 1. If you try something like that, that's a great way to remember where's the minus sign, where is the, is it f of x or g of x squared down below. So we have to prove these results. So to prove the quotient rule, to prove the product rule, to prove all these, we always go back to the definition of the derivative. Rather than proving the quotient rule from scratch, if you know the product and the reciprocal, you get the quotient for free. You can just write this as f of x times 1 over g of x. You apply the product rule to each of these pieces, and then you apply the reciprocal rule to get 1 over g of x. So this is a key feature in mathematics. Mathematicians are lazy. Okay, if I wasn't so lazy, I would say this again to really emphasize the point. You want to leave this class figuring, knowing this. Okay? If nothing else sinks in, we're lazy. We want to reduce things to a previously solved problem as much as possible. You know, work is hard. We want to milk as much as we can from what we've done. We don't want to constantly go back to the definition of the derivative. 
what we notice is the same type of algebraic steps occur again and again and again. Let's do it once with a general function, isolate it, and then just apply it as needed. Is it still recording? Yes. Okay, good. And so, okay, good. Um, so how many of you have ever seen the quadratic formula? How many of you could prove it again on the spot? That's perfectly fine. But you know how to use it. Somebody went through and they codified all the algebra with arbitrary coefficients, you know, a, b, and c, and said, if you do all this, it will lead to this answer. And now you can just apply that formula, you don't have to go through all the steps. It's the same way with these rules, it's the same way with this definition. So let's prove the product rule. And so these proofs are all the same. They all start with the definition of the derivative, and they go from there. So what we'll do is we're going to prove the product rule. Proof of product rule. And so we'll have our function a of x is f of x times g of x. This is actually one of my favorite proofs. It illustrates one of the two key ideas in mathematics. There's essentially only two things we can do. We can add zero, and we can multiply by one. And another way of phrasing this is, we do nothing. We basically take something, we manipulate it by doing nothing, but in a legal way, and at the end of the day, we've written our answer in a more useful format. Okay? The proof of the chain rule requires multiplying by one. We'll talk about that later in the semester. It takes a couple of years in grad school before you become truly proficient in doing nothing. But I have learned how to do nothing quite well. So now, here's the proof. a prime of x is the limit, as h goes to zero, of a of x plus h minus a of x over h. All of these proofs have the same step one, definition of derivative. All of the proofs have the same step two. Step two is put in what the various pieces are. So this is f of x plus h, g of x plus h, minus f of x, g of x, over h. And knowing the punchline, I'm deliberately leaving a lot of space in between. Why am I doing this? I know what's going to happen next. But I want you to have some idea of why this is going to happen. We want to get an f prime. We want to get a g prime. We have a feeling that f prime and g prime should come into play. To get an f prime, I need an f of x plus h minus an f of x over h. This kind of looks like that, except I'm evaluating g here at x plus h, and I'm evaluating g here at, a, at x. So I'm not evaluating them at the same place. Ah, but what if I do this? Here's f of x, g of x plus h, plus f of x, g of x plus h. So I've added 0. Now notice I can pull the g of x plus h out of this piece, and I get f of x plus h minus f of x over h. That's an f prime lurking. So this is the same as the limit as h goes to 0, f of x plus h minus f of x over h times g of x plus h, plus, and I can pull an f of x out of everything here, g of x plus h minus g of x over h. And so now I have a limit of a sum. So the limit of a sum will be the sum of the limits. Then I'll have a limit of a product, which will be the product of the limits. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Limit as h goes to 0, g of x plus h. Plus the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x. And then the limit as h goes to 0 of g of x plus h minus g of x over h. Okay, two of the limits aren't that bad. As h goes to 0, g of x plus h goes to... So I'm evaluating g at points closer and closer to x. In the limit, this piece here is just going to be g of x. Uh, this piece here is particularly nice. No matter what h is, I always get f of x. Okay. And then this piece here, this is just the definition of g prime g of x plus h minus g of x over h. So this piece here is just g prime of x. And then similarly, this piece here is just f prime. And so that's the proof of the product rule. And so we put a little filled-in box 
to just indicate we've reached the end of a proof. Okay, so the key step was, you know, this clever addition of zero. And how do we know to add zero like this? You know, again, it's, it's not nearly as bad to follow a proof as it is to come up with a proof yourself to think, who would have thought to look like this? Well, we tested some things. We looked at, you know, x cubed times x to the fourth, and that gave us some intuition as to what to expect the answer to be. So we wanted to search for an f prime and a g prime, and that led us to doing algebra like this. Okay, there's one more rule. Um, it's easier to state than the quotient rule, but it causes more trouble. It's the chain rule. Uh, the chain rule is one of the most powerful ones. It allows you to have uh, complicated functions depending on complicated functions. Uh, the proof is a bit more involved, and so for now I'm going to skip the proof. So the chain rule. Uh, if a of x is f of g of x, then a prime of x Oh, oh, a prime of x is f prime at g of x times g prime of x. The most important thing to remember is there is a g prime here that's forgotten very often. The other thing that's frequently forgotten is that there's a g of x here. So let me give you an example to illustrate how you know there has to be a g of x here. Let's let g of x be x squared Let's let f of x be the square root of x. Does it make sense to talk about f of g of x? So what kind of inputs do I need to put in for f of x? What do I have to avoid? Negative, negative numbers. Well, g of x is never going to be negative. So it's always going to be well defined to talk about f of g of x. This function a will make sense. Um, I can write this if I want as x to the half. f prime of x is going to be 1 half x to the negative 1 half or 1 half 1 over square root of x. Uh, g of negative 1 is 1. What is f prime of negative 1? So what happens if I try to put in negative 1 for f prime? I'll get 1 half 1 over the square root of negative 1. Yeah. This is not a nice real number. So the domain of the function f requires the input to be non-negative. I'm now trying to evaluate f prime at a place where the input is negative. <coughs> but if I try to evaluate f prime at g of negative 1, then that's f prime at 1, and that's okay. That's 1 half 1 over the square root of 1. So again, the most important thing is to remember where are you evaluating this. If f is being evaluated at g of x, it makes sense that f prime should also be evaluated at g of x. Uh, the other thing is, why is there a g prime of x at the end? So, it's always good to try to get some motivation. Let's let a of x equal x to the n. What's the derivative of a of x? n times x to the n minus 1. Almost. Times. Times. Um, yeah. Times x prime. And so, writing this out in an extreme pedantic, I would have n x to the n minus 1 times 1. Now, I can drop multiplying by 1 without changing the value. That's not going to make any difference. But what's really going on, there really is this times 1. And when we talk about the proof of the chain rule later, we'll get into more detail on this. Okay? So any questions right now on the basics of the rules of derivatives? Alright, so I, um, unlike many of your other math professors, I will let you in on a little secret. There's a huge difference between 103, 104, and the real world. No matter how evil I may be, and you can talk to some of my students about exactly how evil that is, I cannot give you a function to differentiate that you can't do. I can very easily give you a function to integrate that you can't. Okay? Using the rules of the game and the basic derivatives, you can always get any function. Integration is the exact opposite. Almost every function does not have a nice antiderivative, does not have a nice integral. Now, how many of you have taken Math 104 here? How many of you have been given functions to integrate and have had no trouble doing them? We work hard to make sure we give you functions that can be integrated. 
you know, a generic function we will not be able to integrate. So in addition to the rules of derivatives, we want you know, derivatives of certain standard functions. And so the most common functions to know are right here, uh, function and its derivative. So x to the n, its derivative is n, x to the n minus 1. Cosine x, just check minus sine of x. And my mnemonic for this is to remember minus sine. Sine of x goes to cosine of x. <coughs> e to the x goes to e to the x. The natural log of x goes to 1 over x. And then, for those of you who may not have taken a college math class, if we write log, we mean natural log. I'll try to remember to use you know, ln, but in most textbooks they use log to mean the natural log. So these are the common uh, functions. If you want to actually prove some of these derivatives, they require some interesting inputs. You know, the key inputs here are the angle addition formula for sine and cosine, and then some geometric results about you know, limits of trig functions. Uh, exponential function, it's much harder to prove rigorously that its derivative is e to the x. Okay. So, I'm going to just give an example of a function to differentiate. Uh, if you don't believe the function is sufficiently nasty, by all means, feel free to speak up. But let's just say a of x is 4x cubed sine of cosine of x to the 2011. Right? Hopefully this looks like a bad function. Okay. What's nice about the rules of derivatives is if you keep using them, every iteration makes your function nicer and reduces yourself to an easier problem. And after a finite amount of time, you will get to the answer. So the first thing you have to decide is which rule to use first. I have the whole thing to the 2011th power, so I should probably start with the power rule. So I'll write this as a of x is b of x to the n, where n equals 2011 b of x is 4x cubed sine of cosine of x. And so now, I know a prime of x is n b of x to the n minus 1 b prime of x. And so all of a sudden I've reduced from having to calculate the derivative of this to just having to compute the derivative of this. So we've made some progress. Alright, now we look at b of x is 4x cubed sine of cosine of x. This is where you have some choices. What rule do you use next? Two natural answers. Product, and what else could you use? Can't use chain. Chain you would have to have a composition of functions. There is a composition here, but I can't write this whole thing. This whole thing is not a nice function f of g of x. Right? I can't use the chain rule here. I could use the product rule, or I could also use the constant rule with the 4. I think it's a little bit faster to just use the product rule. And so if I want to use the product rule, I then have to write this as c of x times d of x. Okay. And so if I do that, then b prime of x is going to be c prime of x times d of x plus c of x times d prime of x, where c of x is 4x cubed, d of x is the sine of the cosine of x. Well, c prime of x isn't so bad. That's 12x squared. d prime of x is a little bit more painful. But notice now we've reduced it to all I have to do is figure out the derivative of sine of cosine of x. And then once I have that, I feed all this into here, I then feed this all into here. I th okay? There's a bunch of algebraic steps to do, but in principle it's clear. So now all we have to do is compute d prime of x. Once you become very proficient with derivatives, once you've been doing them again for a while, people often do not write all this out in full detail. They'll just do it much more rapidly. If you're having some trouble, if it's been a while, I urge you to write it up like this. You won't make a mistake if you do it this way. Alright, so now all we have to do is figure out the derivative of sine of cosine. 
So since we only have one blackboard, I'm going to erase all this for now. And so we have d of x is sine of cosine of x. And a big hint is whenever you hear the word of, you should be thinking chain rule. So of usually means chain rule. So I want to write this as e of f of x. So what you can do is you can try, all right, let's let e of x be sine of input. Let's let f of x be cosine of x. And if I do that, I can always check, is e of f of x my function? Yes. <coughs> so there, there are several things in this class where there is no excuse for getting a wrong answer, because you can always check. There's no excuse for having the wrong e and f, because you can check and see if your answer is right. Is e of f of x this? There is an excuse for not knowing what e and f should be. But you, know, you should be able to tell if your answer is right because you can check. It's very nice to have a subject where you can check answers. So now we have e prime of x, the root of sine is just cosine of x. f prime of x is negative sine of x. But we don't want e prime of x. We want e prime at f of x. So that's going to be cosine of cosine of x. And then our answer is just d prime of x is e prime at f of x times f prime of x. And so now we just feed all this stuff in here. We now have d prime. Now that we have d prime, we just run up the chain. Any questions on taking derivatives like this? Okay. I realize this is you know quite fast, but okay. So we can now take derivatives of anything. So I'm going to take a quick digression to integrals, and then that will end the first unit of the review. Do we just stop the recording? No, I'm going to, I'll, I'll finish this, and then we'll. Okay. 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 31 minutes. Yep. I know. Uh, so let's do quickly intervals. So basically, you take every differentiation result and you flip it over, and that will give you a an antiderivative. So if the derivative of x squared is 2x, then the antiderivative of 2x is x squared. Or better yet, x squared plus c. So now you have to worry about do we have multiple uh, answers? You know, is there more than one answer? Sadly, yes. Fortunately, the answers have to differ by a constant. So if f prime of x equals g prime of x, then f of x equals g of x plus some constant c. And the reason this is true is think of the story. Imagine you have two people who are always traveling at the same speed. So that's direction and magnitude. So if they're always traveling at the same speed, the distance between them can't be changing. So this is representing the speed, this would be the distance. Okay, so when I write down antiderivatives, my antiderivatives are going to be unique up to a constant. Okay, so the formulas you get is the antiderivative of x to the n is just going to be x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c if n is not equal to negative 1, and the natural log of x if n equals negative 1. Uh, the antiderivative of of cosine of x, the x of what function has derivative of cosine? That should just be sine of x. What function has derivative of sine of x? That should just be uh, minus cosine of x plus c. And what function has derivative of e to the x? That's just e to the x plus c. So these are the basic rules for antiderivatives. These are our key functions. The problem is the rules to combine these functions to calculate antiderivatives are not as nice as the rules to take derivatives. So for instance, uh, does anybody know what function has derivative natural log of x? I claim it's x natural log of x minus x. How many people believe me? This much faith? <laughs> Alright, so if you're skeptical of me, so since not one, for those of you at home, since not one person in the class believes that the antiderivative of natural log of x is x ln x minus x, what can you do? Take the derivative. Take the derivative. So again, in this class there is no excuse for having the wrong antiderivative. 
because you can always check and see, do I get back what I should? There is an absolutely legitimate excuse for not knowing what the antiderivative is. But if you claim that this is the answer, you can always check. This is rare in science to have something like this, where you can know if you've made a mistake. Okay? You know, embrace it. You know, whenever possible, check your answers. If I were to change this a little bit, it would be very hard. For instance, there is no nice antiderivative for the function e to the x squared, or e to the negative x squared. Nothing. We have no nice expression. So in general, <coughs> antiderivatives are much harder. All right, so that completes the first unit. Okay? Any questions on antiderivatives?